Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another English 370 class. I was trying to think of how many we had left. I wasn't actually trying to think about what the class number was. I know we're in English 370. This is probably going to be your penultimate recorded lecture. We'll do this one on Monday, and then we'll do another one on Wednesday, and then we'll wrap up on Thursday instead of Friday. They switched our schedule all about for reasons. I'm sure they have them. Um, so we'll be meeting in person on Thursday to finish the good fight. Um, as for what we're going to be talking about, we took a we took a vote on Friday. If you weren't there in our in-person synchronous classes, I put a straw poll up for English 370 classes and let you vote on our remaining topics, and we had a split decision. But nonetheless, it gave me pretty good direction. In my first class, uh, I teach two, two uh, sections of 370. In the first section, linguistic relativity won the day. So that's what we're going to try and talk about today. And then in my second class, psycholinguistics was the heavy favorite. Psycholinguistics. So um, ideally, we'll get to that on Wednesday. Now, it is true that I usually like to take a bit longer with these topics. Normally, I would um, spread them out in each into two sessions. Am I recording? Good. But we're going to see. We're going to be ambitious here in English 370 and see if we can get the main ideas of each of these subtopics, each in a single classroom. So I may go fast at some points. You say, may just see me like skipping slides, like blah, blah, blah. I don't want to talk about that. Uh, it's not that I don't want to talk about that, so we don't have time. And with that, why am I wasting time? Let's get into it. So as your preamble here, what we're going to look at is we're going to note that we've already been looking at variation within a language for the past week and a half-ish when we were looking at sociolinguistics. Oh, I need to get over here. One second. Sociolinguistics and with the dialectology, those little quizzes that we did. Yeah, that's it. variation within a language. All of us as English speakers use language differently, and that can have important linguistic meaning. What we're going to shift the focus to instead today is we're going to look at variation between languages. How is English different from Hindi? How is Korean different from French, right? Those sorts of differences are called typology. Typology, these are the different, you know, the, it, it's putting languages into these broader categories or types, right? So we can think on a very basic level, an obvious typological one, well, not always obvious, but sometimes obvious is word order, where English has a subject verb object word order Something like um, Japanese has a subject, object, verb, word order, S-O-V. And something like Irish, for instance, has a verb, subject, object, V-S-O, word order. Those are different types. That's part of this typology. So you would say that those three languages, English and Japanese and Irish, are typologically different with regards to their basic word order. And so we want to we wanna start thinking about this stuff, and we want to start thinking about what other ways can languages vary from each other and it, to make these types. And it turns out there's a ton of them, right? We can think of sound systems different. Some languages have certain phonemes or phones. Other ones don't. There's morphological differences. We actually spent a good amount of time talking about that way back when, where we looked at the differences between like synthetic um, languages versus isolating languages, agglutinative languages, um, all kinds of stuff, fusional languages, these different types, typology uh, of languages. We just talked about word order a second ago, and we're going to look at semantics a bit now. That's a weird way of saying it. Not semantics as we have been saying it, but still ways of encoding meaning, and etc. What we want to look at are what chunks of meaning here are worthy of being encoded into things like words or morphological systems. So there's a bunch of different aspects of the world that languages can pay attention to. Right? Think about tense. When we're describing events, one of the things we can encode into the language morphologically, in the case of English, is tense. I walk, he walked, right? That's, a, that's an aspect of the world that we can pay attention to, this temporal aspect. And different languages chunk that up and divide that up in different ways, which is really fascinating, right? Some languages don't have a past tense. Some languages have several past tense. They have a recent past tense and a distant past. Some have a historical past for the way back when. Um, 
So all these different aspects, even something as simple as a timeline, can be divided up differently. We're going to look at another one, um, number, right now. We're going to see how languages can deal with numbers. So we'll, we'll first, of course, start with English. This is a base 10 language. That means that we sort of have 10 basic uh, units, and they start to repeat, right? So you start to see 21, you see 1, 2, 3, and then you see 21, 22, 23. After you get to a new 10 chunk, then you get to 31, 32, 33. And and so once you get um, powers of it then, like, right, you get 100, and then you get 101, and you start repeating its end again. It's a base 10. It's a base 10 system. Um, we also have plural markers. So we mark, um, not only do we count things in certain ways so that we can say, like, you know, um, three phones, but we also put the plural marker on the noun itself, phones, instead of phone. We don't just say three phone. And we see that we actually can make up new numbers, interestingly enough, right? So uh, as, as the information age marches ever onward, we're always having to come up with new types of bytes uh, or things like that. Here's a good example of what base 10 looks like in a system that we're not as familiar with. Sometimes they get sort of a grasp on what we're talking about. Um, it can actually help to see it in a foreign language because we just we don't have to think about our numbers. So instead, you will have to think about Croatian. Um, here's some Croatian data here. So we have numbers, you know, here we have dva, tri, četiri, pjet, probably. I don't speak Croatian, don't hold it against me if they're terribly mispronounced. For two, three, four, five. And then when you see when we get to ten, here, something like djeset, djeset, this is still ten. Um, when we get to, this is 10, right? So this isn't 11. I, I skipped straight to 10s. And when you get to 20, you say 2, dva, 10. Dva, diesit. 2 10s makes 20. 3, diesit makes 30. 3, 3, and 10, diesit. 3, diesit. And it works the same way with uh, 100. Here's sto for 10 10s. And when you get to 2 or 3 hundreds, you get 3 sto. 300s, right? It's a base, base 10. That's, that's what we're talking about there. But that this sort of uh, base 10 system that English relies on isn't the only way to do it, which is kind of fun. We're losing some of our Anglo-centricity here in class today and looking at how other languages do it. So there's languages with uh, base 5, like these Pamanyungan languages spoken in Australia. There's base 20, sort of classically Mayan languages have these base 20 systems, which has effects on their calendar. The infamous Mayan calendar, of course. Uh, I have a fun linguistics problem that has to do with Mayan calendars. If you ever want it, I'll send it your way. But there's also other ones, right? There's base uh, six languages. Some Papuan languages have that. So this is kind of cool to imagine what a base six uh, language would be like. Here is the word for six. So you can kind of like, in order to get a grasp on this, you can think of this as their 10. And it doesn't mean 10, right? If we're talking about how many objects. So to say six, you say nimbo. And they have a separate word. So to say like um, 12, they would say like two nimbos. 18 would be three nimbos. And once you get up to six sixes, six sixes, six to the second power here, 36, it has its own uh, word. So then you get to fate, fate. And if you wanted something like 72, you'd say then like two fates. And it keeps going up, right? So that they have a very specific number. We, the, the, the word we just means 46,656, because that's, of course, six to the sixth power. Who didn't know that? I'm sure you guys all knew that already <laughs> without calculators. Uh, Right, that's cool. That is like our, you know, 10 to the 10th power or whatever, whatever the word for that is in English. Again, we're just, the, the reason just to set our sights on why we're talking about this outside of the fact that it's just cool is that languages are choosing to break up the world into different chunks, right? Objects into sets of 10 or sets of six or whatever. Or if you're Oksatmim, uh, another language spoken in Papua New Guinea, you can have a base 27 system. 
pretty sweet. So they have a set word again for 57, and in order to say 52, you would just say 227s, whatever that is. Chipo or something like that. I forget. Keep, keep one. Anyway, uh, what's kind of fun, I posted a video here as well. You should watch this on your own time. You can even pause the video and watch it. It's a, it's a really endearing video of um, a woman who speaks this language and she's counting to 27. And what you see is that this base 27 system is um, associated with the body very explicitly in this language so that um, when she counts, she has different points. So she goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and then up and around the face and then back down this arm to get to 27. Right. You can think of this as like, well, English is a base 10 system. Is that because of our fingers? Like, like maybe, I don't know. Why isn't, that's, that's not a good, um, is that historically accurate? I have not the faintest idea. Is that a good argument for why uh, base 10 is natural, more natural than other base X systems? No, of course not. Because even if we want to base it on something like our bodies, like, ooh, 10 fingers, we could say like, well, why isn't it base 20? We also have toes. Or, or we could take a cue from Oksatman and say, why isn't it base 27? There's pretty 27 nice, distinct, you know, elbows pretty distinct, shoulders pretty distinct. There's 27 points in our upper body. So you can chunk it in different ways. The language can break things up in a bunch of different ways. Okay, anyway, watch that video, it's sweet. <laughs> so we have all these different um, number systems. I want to bring up one more number. Well, okay, that's not true. I'm going to bring up a couple more number systems. But another way that languages deal with number, right? Some, not all languages are quite so numerically focused as English is. Um, so here's a video that I have also posted of a speaker of the Walpuri language in Australia, sort of North Central Australia. Watch this. If you will, again, feel free to pause and watch it now. And what you'll see is this man is asked several questions um, to which he responds in Walpri. I forget if he's actually asked in Walpri or not. And they ask him, you know, uh, I forget what, how many ask, what, what do they ask him? How many wives do you have? And he says one, something, something like that, at least it may not be. And then they ask him how many children he has, and he says many. And what it's easy to, it's easy to jump to conclusions here and kind of like poke fun and laugh like, ah, he doesn't know how many children he has. He just says many. Well, that's, that's obviously not the case. And if you watch this video, it becomes very clear that this is also not the case. He knows how many children he has, right? Of course he knows how many children he has. And you can see this because he marks them in the sand. One, two, three. But he doesn't say three. He says many because that's what his language has words for. Um, so we don't want to, uh, what I'm, what, the reason I'm talking about this and spending a little more time on numbers than I'd like is that what we see happening here is that just because a language doesn't have words for something, right? This, this Walpuri language doesn't have a word for three. It doesn't have these numerical words like English does. It doesn't limit the cognition of the speakers, right? It is not as though just because it doesn't have a number for three, this man in the video doesn't know how many children he has, or that he doesn't know the difference between the many of how many children he has and the many of how many people there are in the world. Like, obviously he knows those differences. The language just doesn't have um, a simple way of expressing those. He can express those. In this case, he does so very uh, succinctly by drawing in the sand. One, two, three. So we're already starting to see um, these questions of the language you speak and the way that you think. Right. That's going to be our core topic in just a, in, a, in a bit. We're going to talk about that. Does the language that you speak affect the way that you think? It's a really cool question. And already I want you to be thinking about this as we go through and look at some of these typological examples of ways that languages 
are different. Um, there's some cool grammatical differences here, right? So that was counting-ish of numbers. On the other hand, we have these morphological markers like the plural morpheme S, but we see languages doing this in a bunch of cool ways too, where um, English has a singular and plural distinction. We have like one dog, two dogs, three dogs, four dogs, a billion, million dogs, 27 dogs, whatever it is, uh, you just get dogs if it's more than one. But some languages have uh, more specific morphological encodings than that. Some languages have a dual encoding. So you'd say something like one dog, two uh, dog, f that's for two. And then you'd say three dogs, four dogs, five dogs. Another where the f is a, is a totally made up randomly um, dual marker that we're going to add to English. You ready, class? Dog, f two dog, f two ear, f um, or you can have a trial one that's a little bit rarer, uh, but some some languages have those. Some sometimes they're limited to just the pronominal systems, um, and not. Or you don't have to have any overt marking on nouns whatsoever, right? Instead of saying three dogs, you could just say three dog, and like you understand that there's more than one of them because you already said three. English is a bit redundant in that way if you want to think about it that way. Anyway, cool. There's also other uh, sort of interesting counting mechanisms in language. I talk about. I'm going to talk about this one. This is a, a, an element of Mayan called classifiers. It's not unique to Mayan. Um, other languages also have different sorts of classifiers. I think Chinese has some classifiers, although I'm not certain they work in this exact same way. And what you have here is is really interesting. It's fascinating. Look at look at this data presented to you from Tzotzil. So I've given you the word for humans, uh, which is vol. I've given you the word for four, chanib. See, here's chanib. Um, here's the word for man is vinik, the man being li vinik. This is the determiner li. And so in order to say four men, <clears throat> you might think that you say something like chanib for vinik man for man for man but you don't you don't say that you don't say this you don't say for man instead what you have to say in this language is you have to say chanvo vo vinik chanvo vinik again i don't speak mayan and I'm, i can't say i'm trying particularly hard to to pronounce this correctly you'll get the idea regardless chanvo vinik and so what they did, what this means is four, it's the root for four here, chan, plus this little um, classifier, which means humans. So it's like four humans, men. So if you wanted to say um, six women, you would still use this volt. This is for people, right? It's for humans, not necessarily just for men. So you'd say vakvo, six humans, ants, women, six women, four human, four human, six humans, Whew. excuse me, uns, six women. And there's a different classifier depending on what object you're counting. So if we want to count animals instead, instead of using volt, which is only for humans, you'd use cot, cot for animals. So you'd say chan cot, for animals, kashlan, chickens, or whatever this X is supposed to be in the language, I don't know. Chan cot kashlan, for animals, chickens. Vak Beige na. Vak beige na. Six round squattish things, and yes, also their houses. Right? So you have to attach the appropriate classifier to in order to be able to count these things. And you use different classifiers for different um, for different sorts of objects, whether they're humans, animals, round squattish things, different shapes get different classifiers. Um, Sometimes different materials get different classifiers, etc. So, uh, yeah, classifiers. This this we talk about for two reasons. One, because I think it's wicked cool. And two, because we're going to see it play a part in uh, an experiment that we're going to do later on today. Does English have anything like this? That's a good question that we should ask ourselves. Is there anything like this in English? This classifier as well? Sometimes. Sometimes. When we look at things that are mass nouns, 
so that we don't, um, yeah, there are mass nouns like water or something like that. We often have to put a quantifier with them, a classifier to quantify them, excuse me. So instead of just saying like one water, you say a glass of water or two glasses of water, two waters is weird. Like, okay, if you're at a restaurant, you can say that because it's assumed that they come in glasses there. But otherwise, when we're outside of those sort of um, particular pragmatic contexts, you need to um, specify a glass of water, a bottle of water, pitcher of water, what sort of thing of water you want. That's somewhat like saying two glasses, water, two people, women. It's a little bit like that. Or with grasses, you can say a blade of grass. What, what? What unit? You kind of need a unit here. That's the word I was looking for. A blade of grass or three blades of grass. If you say three grasses, that sounds weird. Uh, again, pragmatically, that means like three types of grass. Like if you're you know, a fantastic gardener and there's three grasses in this display case. Or you can tell I'm not a fantastic gardener. So that's kind of interesting. I don't want to talk about this. I'm going to skip some of this stuff until later. And when we look at all these typological differences, we start to see, like we said, that languages care about different aspects. They chop up the world differently. They pay attention to different features. So, you know, these grammatical care, languages differ in how they view these grammatical categories. We looked at number, We've talked about tense having different tenses. Here's one that can help drive this point home is evidentiality. So some languages have this um, feature called evidentiality, which essentially says that you have, whenever you give a statement, sort of a declarative statement, you have to include how you know the information. So think of it a bit like tense in English. Whenever you say a declarative sentence in English, you have to also assign it tense of when it happened. Whether I walk, I walked, or I will walk. You have to put tense. You can't just say like a tenseless form of it. It doesn't make sense. You need to tell your listener when this thing happened. And in languages that have evidentiality like Navajo, um, you have to tell your speaker how you know the information. So if I say that, um, if I say uh, John won the race, John won the race, I would have to in Navajo include how I know that information. I could either say John won the race and I know that because I saw him win it with my own eyes. I was there. I have direct access to that knowledge that John won the race. Or I could say something like, I heard that John won the race. Somebody told me. I, John won the race, and I know that because I've received the report, but I wasn't actually there. So there's a difference in evidentiality. And there's another one for maybe, like, I'm less certain. Like, John won the race. It's rumored. Like, I don't really have a good source of information, but I've heard word on the street is that John won the race. That's evidentiality. And in some languages, you have to provide that information. In English, you can. I can say these things like, it's rumored that, or I heard that, or I know that, but, in, but we don't have to. And in Navajo, you have to provide these. So what we've been looking at are different ways that languages um, encode different pieces of the world experience into their language through grammatical categories like the ones that we're looking at right now. This is a bit of a scattered start to a lecture, but I'm 24 minutes in and I'm not restarting it now. So uh, take what you can from this first half of the lecture as far as languages encode different aspects of the lived and shared human experience, we all experience these things somewhat similarly, right? As far as tense goes, as far as evidentiality goes, but our languages dictate that we incorporate different chunks of these into our language. Some say yes to tense, some say no to evidentiality, some switch that, etc. It's really cool. It's really cool. Ways that languages differ. 
So now we come to the elephant in the room, the, the reason we've been talking about this typology, which is, does the language we speak affect the way we perceive the world? And we want to think about this given the information that we've just been looking at, given that the language that we speak forces us to include different elements of information, does that change the way that we perceive the world or that we think? This is a concept called um, the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, named after um, two of the people that uh, sort of proposed it. Edward Sapir and Benjamin Lee Whorf. It's also called linguistic relativity. So those, those terms, at least in the ways that we're using them for this class, are interchangeable. Linguistic relativity and the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. So you may have heard of either of these. They kind of come around in things like pop, pop culture and um, science fiction often, again, most famously in the past few years, the movie Arrival uses uh, the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis as its uh, sort of key mechanic, no spoilers. Um, watch the movie, it's fantastic. Uh, sometimes I make my classes watch it, but we're online, so that doesn't make sense. Anyway, why is it called the Spearwarf Hypothesis? Well, like I said, it's named after these two dudes uh, that proposed it. And they come from this certain, like, sort of um, school of linguistics. We'll call it the Boazian tradition. And this is itself named after their mentor, Franz Boaz. And Franz Boaz is a super important um, figure in linguistics. He was uh, in anthropological linguistics. He's an anthropologist. But in America, in the United States, the tradition of linguistics kind of grew out of anthropology itself, and in particular, people like Franz Boas. So we start to see the American scene of linguistics developing through anthropology itself, through these, these sorts of people who are doing a lot of field work at the time. They were going out into especially Native American communities um, and studying languages and seeing these big typological differences because they had finally broken out of their um, Indo-European bubble that Europe was still kind of stuck in. Um, and they started noticing these, these, these changes and wondered about how these big typological differences affect people's thought patterns. So here is uh, Worf himself in 1956 is going to tell us like it is. He says this linguistic relativity principle means in informal terms that users of markedly different grammars are pointed by their grammars towards certain types of observations and different evaluations of externally similar or externally identical, uh, I added that, acts of, acts of observation. Thus, we're not equal or equivalent as observers, but must arrive at somewhat different views of the world. And so what, what Worf is trying to say here is, again, he's getting at that superior Worf hypothesis, that linguistic relativity question, but he's saying, like, look, if, if your language forces you think again about evidentiality, to always be talking about how you know some information, then it's not unreasonable for us to think that Navajo speakers have better, they pay more attention to how they know information than English speakers do. Right, so if me and a Navajo speaker view the same sort of experience, we might be paying attention to different aspects of the exact, the self-same um, experience because it's needed for our language, right? We might be paying attention to numbers differently or paying attention to um, tense and time and space and matter and these sorts of things differently depending on what we'll later need to tell the story, perhaps. That's, that's one sort of baseline viewpoint of the superior wharf hypothesis, which I think makes a lot of sense at a, at a basic level. We'll, we'll probe at this as we go. Um, we'll talk about this. I don't want to read giant walls of text, so read those on your own time if you like. Um, at this point, of course, the question that you can and possibly should be asking yourself is, um, show me the proof. Show me. Is there evidence of this? Cool, cool thought experiment, Worf. Sweet. Nice one, Sapir. Is there evidence for this? And that's what we want to be talking about. That's what we're going to talk about. 
So here is, uh, I'm going to talk about for the rest of class, I might have a few things afterwards, but I'm going to talk about two experiments that were done um, to try and to try and see if there is, to try and provide evidence either for or against the Sapir Wharf hypothesis. It's notably a tricky thing to test. It's a very tricky thing to test. So we want to be thinking about, these are very good uh, researchers. This first study is done by John Lucy uh, in the early 90s. He's at the University of Chicago. Um, very good researchers, but we do want to be critical of their methodology, not critical, we want to be, we want to pay close attention to their methodology to see how they're getting at this, because it's a weird, tricky question. How do we know how people think anyway, right? Because what we want to see is if people, the language people speak affects the way that they think. But you never really know what anybody's thinking. So what do we do instead? The next best thing. What we'll want to see, as John Lucy will show us in this experiment, is what we can use as sort of a proxy for this, is we'll see if speakers of different languages behave differently, systematically. And we'll try and connect these differences in behavior with differences in language that they speak. So we'll say, look, these two, two groups of speakers who speak different languages, perform this task differently. And thus, we'll want to say that, and the reason they performed that task differently is because they speak a different language. That's the jump that can be hard, right? Because we're, none, we're not sure whether the reason they performed that task differently is because they speak a different language or because it's just generally or they just did it for some other reason. There might be confounding factors there, like culture. Not because they come from, they speak a, a, a language natively, but because they're embedded in a certain culture. It's really hard to tease that apart. Hopefully that will make some more sense after um, we look at this first experiment. Sweet, so we already looked at, um, I already primed your pump by telling you about classifiers. So this is, we're going to look at a difference where the two groups of speakers, again, we're going to take two groups of speakers and we're going to assign them a task and see how they perform differently. Um, English speakers and Yucatec Mayan speakers. Uh, Mayan, as we noted, in a different Mayan language has classifiers. So does Yucatec. So here in Yucatec, numerals must be accompanied by a numeral classifier, and they provide that extra bit of information that you need for counting, right? So here is um, an example from Yucatec, un uh, one long thin wax, where this tzit means long thin, and kib is wax. I think that's how that breaks down. Anyway, they have to specify these things. So, okay. I'm going to show you the experiment on the next slide, but you have to promise me, promise me, that you won't read the text. All right. Only have eyes for pictures. No reading text, because I didn't split them apart. I realized too late. Um, so only look at the pictures on the following page. What you're going to see is three objects. You're going to see three objects on the next slide. And what I want you to do, class, oh class, my class, is to put these three objects into two groups. You have three objects, you need to put them into two groups. So what this means, uh, because math, is that one of the groups is going to have two objects and the other um, group is only going to have one object. So you're going to put two on one side and one on the other side. And you're going to split them up however you want. There's just three objects. However you want to split them up is fine. You ready? And do this before you read the text or you fail my class. So here is your, here are your three objects, and you have to put them into two groups. This is the task that um, John Lucy gave to his speakers. Again, two groups, one um, English-speaking group and one Yucatec Mayan-speaking group. And what he found is that systematically, speakers of English and speakers of Yucatec put these into different groups. They don't perform this task Similarly, English speakers 
So if you are at home and you're a native or, or an English speaker, um, this can be biased by what your native speaker is. So I think he tried to take as monolingual of speakers as he could. Of course, with Yucatec Mayan, there was almost certainly overlap with Spanish. Um, English speakers tend to put the two boxes together, as I would. If I was doing this, I've done it countless times, although you can only really do it kind of once, and then you get the, you get the idea. I would take these boxes and put them together and say, here's group A, these two go together, and this random cardboard square is in a group by itself. But Yucatec speakers do this differently. They prefer material-based classifications. So when they are faced with this task, it's of course with real objects, not with pictures, but alas and alack online, uh, they put the two cardboard objects together and they put this one separately. I can imagine their hypothetical reasoning be like, yeah, these, these are both cardboard. This is a random plastic object. What's it doing there? Get it out of there. These things are obvious, similarly similar. They're, they're cardboard. Where me, as an English speaker, I say, look at these two boxes. What is this random square doing? I focus in more on shape. And so maybe the, the assumption goes is maybe that something like the classifiers cue them into something like material, that they're paying, they're paying more attention to material than they are to shape because of the language that they speak. Where English, uh, we would describe these as two boxes, whatever. We don't have to talk about a plastic box versus a, a cardboard box. We pay more attention to shape and put those in there. OK, that's our first experiment. Does that make sense? It's kind of cool, right, that, that, that speakers do this systematically different. By the way, if you put the cardboard things together, that's totally fine. This isn't 100% and 100%, right? So there's still a pretty meaningfully different meaningful difference if like 70% of English speakers do the box group as opposed to 30 for the cardboard. And Yucatec is more like 70% do the cardboard and 30% do the boxes. These aren't, these aren't um, black and white things. People have, there's internal variation even within speakers, but there's, we see a difference in tendencies here, which is really cool, which is really cool. So now you see the coolness, you see, you start to see some evidence and you might think to yourself, whoa, that is weird. And you're right. But you might also start to see more clearly some of the trouble with this type of test in which um, we don't know whether it's the fact that these speakers speak English that, they're, that, that causes them to do this differently versus Yucatec, or whether it's a cultural phenomenon. The culture that these Yucatec Mayan speakers are embedded in them has them pay more attention to material. It's not the language they speak, it's the culture. That's hard to tease apart. And we can talk more about this. It's not, not all hope is lost. And John Lucy himself uh, tries to account for this in some really intelligent and really clever ways that we can talk about on Thursday. It's preliminary evidence. It hints at something. It doesn't prove it, but it's preliminary evidence that hints that there might be something going on here. Okay, you guys ready for experiment number two? How am I doing on time? Oh, I'm doing pretty good, actually. Oh, no, I'm not doing so good. <laughs> I can't see. We got time for this. We got one more experiment. This one's going to be, it's much easier for me to do this experiment with you in the classroom. But nonetheless, I'm going to ask you to do it now. So um, I want you to write down somewhere that you won't forget. Write down somewhere how you performed this test whether you did the boxes. So if you write Sapir Wharf experiment one and write, if you did the boxes, write boxes. And if you did the cardboard, write cardboard. And I want, to, I want you to report in to me on Thursday when we meet in class, how you performed on this task. Does that make sense? So that you remember how you did this task. The same is gonna be true of our next task. The next one's a little bit more complicated. So buckle in, buckle in class. What I need you to do is set, set your space around you up in a really weird way. I'm going to mess with my camera. Okay. So what I need you to have is I need you to have two surfaces. I need you to have a surface in front of you, a flat surface with a reasonable amount of space. And I need you to have a surface behind you. Note my... Uh, the back of my chair here, holding my objects. So one surface in front of you, one surface behind you. If you, uh, you can always just do this on the floor. If you sit on the floor, you'll have a surface in front of you and a surface behind you. 
And next, what I need you to have are three objects. Here we go. Here we go. Three objects. So we have our, I'm going to, my head's going to be out of the screen. You'll forgive me. We have our three lovely models today. We have our otter, our platypus. This is a platypus. Hello. And this is our hedgehog on the end. So your objects need to be not symmetrical, right? They need to have like distinct features. So you can't use like a phone because it's like a little too symmetrical. They need to have like fronts and backs and tops and bottoms and sides and sides and stuff like that. So stuffed animals work really well for this. Um, it's actually a little bit challenging to um, find not symmetrical objects. Books work fine for this too. If you have books near you, you can use books, whatever. So I'll pause and set up your space in front of you, behind you. Okay, if you want, you can just watch me do it, but you'll be really lame. It's better if you participate. This is a hands-on kind of YouTube video. Okay, so now arrange your objects in front of you. Here are my objects are arranged. And what you're going to do now is you're going to take a picture of these objects. I'm going to do it myself, right? Here's my phone. Take your first picture of your objects. Yeah, how's this? See? Objects. Now, now what you're going to do is you're going to look, observe the scene in front of you, and you're going to recreate this scene on the surface behind you. You're going to recreate this exact scene on the surface behind you. I'm going to do it too. So I'm taking this scene and I'm going to recreate it over here. Can you see my friends? Oh, you can see my friends. Okay, so now what I need you to do is take another picture of the scene that you just recreated. Okay, you got it? Did you do it? I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, look at me now. Now I want you to look at your two pictures. Look at the two pictures on your phone. So here's my first picture of my little dudes. And here is my second picture of my little dudes. Is it the same? It's the same. But I'm willing to bet, I am willing to bet that not all of your pictures are the same. I bet you that not all of your pictures are the same. And by, what I mean by the same is the same in certain ways. So there's the, the fun part of this task and why we're doing it is that there are multiple ways, actually quite a lot of ways to perform this task. So I had my setup like this, I believe. Confer with my picture. Supposed to have looked like that. Here it looks like this. I had them like this. And I, what I did when I recreated my scene behind me is I did a rotational move, right? So I took these things, I actually took two at once, and I went, rotate, 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 and set them up. But what I could have done, oops, what I could have done instead was this. And now, and that's, do we see how that's different? Maybe your pictures aren't different. Maybe I lied about that part, but sometimes they are, depending on how you do them. So here, it's a difference between a rotation, where I go like this. So note their order. We're gonna say that um, this, all of our animals are facing 
the what side of the screen this side of the screen and if I do rotational now they're facing this they're facing the other way right they turned around they were facing this way and now they're facing this way they're all turned about they're all turned about but if I do the non-rotational one, if I do the just straight back and forth swapper like this, they're facing this way. And they're still facing this way. Still facing that way, right? So you'll get different pictures, right? The pictures on my phone should get different pictures, I think, if I'm not, if I'm not mad here, yeah. I know the pictures on my phone are, are probably not great quality. So my results either look like this or like this. Like this or like this. Okay, there are different zooms. But you can see, most importantly, that the way that they're facing has changed, depending on how you complete this task. So this was my OG. This was rotational symmetry. And this was the not rotational symmetry, I believe. Isn't that cool? <laughs> I hope you think that's cool. I find that fascinating. Um, and I bet that, like I said, I bet that the, at least the, those are the kind of, the, there are actually other ways of doing this. The, um, that we, all, we can talk about on Thursday if you like, but I bet that you guys perform this differently. I bet that people perform this differently in our class. <coughs> and what we're paying attention to is that there are, what we're gonna say, there. oh yeah, you can see my screen, still good. <laughs> there are three frames of reference. I should have blown myself up bigger so you could see better for that part. Well, mistakes were made. We're seeing a difference between frames of reference and what frames of reference people are cued into. And we'll look very briefly in the, the remaining time we have between intrinsic, relative, and absolute frames of reference. So intrinsic frame of reference is this. We're gonna see the same picture in, in these all three of these cases and they're gonna be described differently. So if we say something like he's in front of the house, what we're paying attention to is some some object that has a front and a back and sides, and we're saying he's standing closest to the front of it, right? With our animals, that would be something like the platypus is in front of the otter, right? We're paying attention to the, the sides, the, in, the intrinsic properties of the thing itself. That's one way to describe this situation. <laughs> But there's another one, right? We can also think of a relative one, a relative way of describing this, which is he's to the left of the house. He is to the left of the house. And here, what's interesting, what is happening here is that we have a, a different point of reference. We've removed what we call, what we're gonna call the deictic origo, right? The, the referent point is actually neither the house nor the person, but this random observer this random third person relative observer. And this observer is saying, well, he's that a ways from the house. This is a weird uh, frame of reference. I don't mean to be judgmental, but it's a strange frame of reference because as soon as you change the origo, if the origo were on the other side, you would describe the situation differently. If the origo were over here, you would say he's to the right of the house to describe the exact same configuration. And note that this doesn't change depending on where you are. Whether you're over here or you're over here, he's still in front of the house. And that's also true of our last frame of reference, which is um, an absolute frame of reference. Think of this as roughly having to do with cardinal directions, right? So this is something like he's north of the house. He's north of the house. And the, these each share different properties. So this one shares with the intrinsic one that it doesn't matter where you are. 
whether you're over here or you're over here, he's still north of the house. But the absolute takes it one step further. It doesn't even care about the rotation of the house. So imagine that you um, went and you picked up the house and you spun it, pump. So that the face is, you spin it 90 degrees. He's still north of the house. But in this one, if you pick up the house and you spin it, chunk. He's not in front of the house anymore. He's probably to the side of the house, one of the sides. Or if you flipped it 180, then he's behind the house. Right? Imagining that houses have fronts and backs, etc. So they each have this different sort of point of reference, this different frame of reference for talking about configurations of objects. He's in front of the house, he's to the left of the house, he's north of the house. And that has to do with what we are experiment here. Right? That has very much to do with this experiment. Right? Um, for the way that I completed this task, just we'll wrap up here. I said something like, this little hedgehoggy boy, this hedgehoggy dude is on my right. He's to the, my right side, so that when I spin them rotationally, hedgehog boy is still to my right over here, my right side. So that's more of a, uh, I was using more of a relative frame of reference here because I'm very uh, egocentric and self-obsessed or something like that. Uh, no, that has nothing to do with it. Um, and if you do it the other way, <clears throat> if you did it the other way, like this, and you went instead like this, we'll see that um, this actually isn't relative because little hedgehog used to be on my right and now he's on my left. But instead, it's a little bit more um, absolute, actually. So instead, hedgehog was the, the eastmost, given my current placement. He was the eastmost animal. And when I move him now, he remains the eastmost animal. And this guy's in the, on the west. This guy is west of the platypus. This guy is east of the platypus. And if I directly transpose them like this. That remains to be true. This guy is still east of the platypus, and this guy is still west of the platypus. So we're picking up on different frames of reference in really cool and interesting ways. And what we see here, last one, last part, I swear. <laughs> I know I've gone long. This is just talking about it. What we see is that um, languages, where was, my, where was my slide that I wanted? Languages, people differ on how they complete this task, and it seems to be influenced by the language that they speak. It seems to be influ influenced by the language that they speak. I have a better slide for this. Yeah, here's, here's a better slide for this. So we see that, you know, Japanese speakers tend to do relative, um, speakers of Austronesian and Mayan and especially Palman Jungian languages are really famous for this. They're really good at absolute locations. They'll, they'll talk about everything in uh, east, west, north, south. Really, really heavily depend on cardinal directions. And uh, as a result of that, they're extremely good at knowing their cardinal directions at all time. Um, and some people do just intrinsic Right, so uh, some other Mayan and Austronesian languages. And we see that when you test speakers of different groups, they test different ways. They test different ways. So English speakers, I think we're supposed to, uh, so it's not supposed to, I think English speakers tend towards um, relative, which is how I did it first. They tend towards relative, but that doesn't mean that you uh, also don't get a fair bit of absolute. So if you did it the weird way, that's totally fine. It's actually a fairly, uh, it's not that uncommon. For, usually when I, when I conduct this experiment in classrooms, I usually get about 60, 40. Uh, well, to be fair, usually I get about 50% of people do it relative, about 30% of people do it absolute, and the other 20% do it some uh, uh, different mixture. 
like well they're well they're act they won't pay attention to which way the animals are actually facing and so they'll change it from where the animals are all facing each other in a line like this and they'll change it to something where the animals are like face to face instead of front to back so um, not paying attention in that case to the intrinsic properties of the animals they're 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 very anti intrinsic <laughs> if we want to say that. So here, that's just cool. These are two really cool examples of um, evidence that the way that you speak has some effect on your behavior. And through that behavior, we hope to get a viewpoint into people's patterns of thinking, that you perform this task differently because you have a different way of thinking about it. You're paying attention to different things. So really what we're after is the, the way that you the language that you speak affects the way that you think. We'll pick up on this. I'll probably spend the first 15 minutes or so of Wednesday's class talking more about this, um, just to wrap up a couple things I didn't get to. And then we're gonna spend the other um, portion of class talking about psycholinguistics. I'm sorry that this lecture went long. I know I'm at 56 minutes now, gasp. Um, Apologies. Uh, we're trying to crunch a bunch of stuff in. So I hope you liked today's lecture. I hope you liked my friends that I brought with me today. Um, and I hope you learned something about yourself and your frame of reference. And maybe, just maybe, I started to convince you that uh, the way, the language that you speak might actually have an effect on the way that you think. We'll, we'll bring that up as a discussion point in thurs on Thursday's class. In Thursday's class? Thursday's class for sure. Catch you guys later. Until next time.